Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. I'm a professional poker player with over $7 million in live tournament earnings and a bunch online as well. And for the last few months, I've been working on a new secret project. It is my newest book, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, The Essential Guide. This is actually a complete rewrite, remake, etc., of my first tournament series that I wrote 10 years ago, put into one gigantic book, as you can see, lots and lots of range charts, hand examples, everything you need to know to succeed at tournament poker. And today, I'm going to walk you through it. As you can see, here is the title page, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, The Essential Guide. It is a big, hardcover book, about 450 pages. I've seen some of my students' books. Uh, they got a long time ago, and they've read very, very often, and those books are worn out. So I did my best to make this a big, sturdy, hardcover book. Of course, you can get the ebook version as well. It is published by D&B Poker. They published the absolute best poker books on the market. Let's go through the table of contents real quick, then I'll show you a few pages of the book. So first things first, how do tournaments work? It's important to understand the game structure that you are playing. Tournaments are not cash games and should be approached differently, right? We explained why they are so profitable, and also, just like the general fundamentals, right? It's very important to understand the basics. You have to learn to walk before you can run, right? So we discuss how you should not really get stuck on formulas. A lot of people think that they're gonna have to do all sorts of math at the poker table, but that's just not true. You do need to do some work away from the table, but this book outlines everything you need to know in order to succeed. We also discuss the, uh, you know, the basics really, like thinking in terms of hand ranges, counting combinations so you know what ranges are comprised of. We discuss expected value, pot odds, implied odds, reverse implied odds, and a bunch of other stuff. All right, next, we go through and explain how to play at various stack depths. We're gonna discuss deep stacked play, medium stacked play, and shallow stacked play. Now, you see here we have deep stacked play listed as 50 big wines. In the previous version of this book that I wrote 10 years ago, deep stacked was actually 75 big blinds or more, but, in basically all poker tournaments now, you do not play all that deep stacked in the beginning. Uh, back in the day, you would start with 200 big blinds and the tournaments would take forever. Now they are substantially faster paced for whatever reason. And therefore, I would recommend that most of you spend most of your time studying the shallow and medium stacked portions of the game. That said, uh, you do need to know how to play at least somewhat deep stacked as well because you will be playing deep stacked in the beginning of poker tournaments. So we discuss how to play preflop. It's important to understand that. Every single range chart that you are not going to need, well, every single range chart that you are going to need could not fit in this book. It's 450 pages already, but I have links to all of the charts that you could possibly need to be sure that you have a reference guide so that you can learn how to play essentially every spot before the flop from a fundamentally sound manner. And then in the book, I explain how to adjust to take advantage of whatever your opponents do incorrectly. We also discuss various post-flop concepts, like the four types of hands. If you're not already doing this, you generally want to be thinking about your hands in terms of whether or not it is a premium-made hand that you're happy getting a lot of money in, things like sets and straights and whatnot, right? Then uh, marginal-made hands. These are going to be hands that are pretty good but don't want to get all the money in. That's going to be stuff like top pair bad kicker, middle pair good kicker, etc. Draws, and then in the draws, you need to be thinking of it as a very, very good draw. You're happy getting money in. A medium strength draw that you are, eh, happy with, but not happy enough to get all in with. And then a really junky draw that is like a, a bad gut shot straight draw that maybe you use it as a bluff, right? So you want to be classifying the draws like that. And then you're also going to have junk. And in this very, very big section, we explain how to think about your range and go about balancing your range from a fundamentally sound manner so that you can to some extent replicate what a game theory optimal game to game theory optimal what a game theory optimal solver would do because at the end of the day if you play closer to a fundamentally sound strategy than your opponents even if you don't know what they do wrong you are going to win in the long run now again of course you always want to make sure you are exploiting your opponents a lot of this book is about taking the fundamentally sound manner uh, strategy and then adjusting to whatever your opponent's doing correctly. So make sure you are actively doing that. We discuss playing the flop deep stacked, playing the turn deep stacked, playing the river deep stacked. And then there are you know various other 
topics that are relevant, like fancy play syndrome, for example. This is something that keeps a lot of, you know, pretty good poker players stuck in the small and medium stakes games indefinitely because they think they're supposed to be in there trying to outplay everyone every single betting round. And I hate to break it to you, very often you don't even know what your opponent's doing. You may have ideas, you may be guessing, but you don't know. And when you don't know, that's going to result in you essentially leveling yourself into making poor plays that are very far away from the fundamentally sound strategy, and that's going to be really bad for you. All right, then we go through medium stacked play. We break this down 35 to 50 and 27 to 35. Those stacks do play a little bit differently, and they actually do play substantially differently than when you're playing, let's say, 100 big blinds deep. So we go through and we discuss things like um, the all-in squeeze play, stealing from early position, which is something you really cannot get away with whenever you are playing very deep stacked because... You're just going to get maximally punished when you happen to run into a good hand because you're going to be out of position. And the, whenever you're playing deep stacked out of position, you better come with a good hand. But as you get shallower, that's not quite as true, especially if your opponents play poorly. Um, then we discuss short stacked play below 27 big blinds. We break that down 15 to 27, 5 to 15, and then fewer than 5. A lot of people think that you should only go all in or fold when you have something like 15 big blinds. But that is a gigantic mistake that's been, uh, I guess, a spread by people who have push-fold charts. If you only use two options, though, push or fold, you're taking a lot of your other substantially more profitable options like min-raise off the table. Now, by shoving or folding, of course, you make your decisions really easy in exchange for losing a lot of money. And that's really bad. I want to make sure that you are using a relatively simple strategy that you can actually implement at the table, but one that is also very profitable, right? And we discuss that. It, it is okay to raise and then fold when you have 15 big blinds or even 12 big blinds. Again, lots and lots of uh, charts for you to reference will be available if you buy this book. You can go and download them so that you have everything you could possibly need available for you. Then we discuss playing the late stages of the tournament, essentially adjusting to payout implications, right? Early in the tournament, the idea of survival is not all that important because you're a long way from getting in the money. But as you get deeper and deeper into the tournament, like on the bubble or once you're in the money or at the final table, payout implications become very, very important. I'll actually show you a chart or two from that section today. We discuss shorthanded play, right? As you get shallow, uh, short, deeper and deeper in the tournament, inevitably you're going to have to play shorthanded and you want to make sure you are adjusting properly and taking advantage of your opponents who do not adjust properly. Then we have a bunch of hand examples going through how to play the fundamentally sound strategy, not just with your hand, but with your entire range on every betting round. It's a big in-depth section, um, very similar to the homework I have at my training site, pokercoaching.com, where I ask you what you would do on every single decision point with your entire range that you get to that point with. And that's how you need to be thinking about poker. A lot of people think they're supposed to be thinking in terms of, oh, I had pocket jacks and I raised and it came ace seven three. What do I do? But that's not a great question because sometimes you have ace-king, sometimes you have ace-ten, sometimes you have eight-seven suited, right? Don't think about your exact hand. You have to think in terms of hand ranges. All right, next we discuss various other considerations, including you know, continuing to learn, right? You want to make sure that you are always improving your skills. If you think that you're going to read one poker book out there, even a very good one like this one, and never have to study again, you're probably fooling yourself because... You want to make sure you are consistently striving to improve at a faster rate than your opponents are. You got to realize poker is a competitive game where you're playing for substantial money. And typically when you're playing for substantial money, most of your opponents are going to care at least some. And if you care none or the absolute minimum, you're going to get left behind. And I want to make sure you're continuing to study and improve your skills long term. We also discuss the mental and physical approach to poker. We talk about things like luck, tilt, intuition, etc. right? These are all things that are a little bit nebulous, but are very, very relevant to poker. We have a big section here on tells, physical tells, online tells. Um, to be fair, I don't think tells are all that relevant in the very high stakes games because most people in the high stakes games have really good poker faces. But in the small and medium stakes games, tells are quite valuable. And the thing is, a lot of people get it in their heads. I'm going to find a tell every single hand against every single person I play. But I don't think it really works like that. You'll find tells sometimes. Maybe, I don't know, 10% of the hands that you play. And then they may not even be all that relevant of tells. But when you do find a consistent, reliable tell, you can adjust your strategy quite substantially, and that's going to result in you winning substantially more money from those players, right? 
So don't think you're going to be, uh, you know, magically reading your opponent's souls every single hand. Hate to break it to you. It's not how poker works. You need to play a fundamentally sound strategy and then adjust according to whatever they're doing correctly. And if they have a physical tell that essentially removes a large portion of their range from their range, because let's say you know they're strong, that means they don't have any bluffs, that will allow you to make big folds, right? And you will just never hero call them in those scenarios. Then we discuss um, practical tips for tournament play. Like protect your cards. I know that sounds super simple, but you don't want to let your opponent see your hands and you don't want to let the dealer take your cards unnecessarily. Common sense, I know, but it happens. And there are a lot of other various things like this, like checking in the dark, betting weird bet sizes. Like, does it matter if you bet 800 or 775? Will that make your opponent play differently? Maybe it will, maybe it, diff maybe it won't. We discuss chopping the prize pool, when you should, when you shouldn't. We discuss how you should generally play very quickly, assuming you have an edge, because if you have an edge, you want to play as many hands as possible, right? Because every single hand you're dealt in, you make money. As you can see, this is a big book. Very, very, uh, it covers everything, right? This is the essential guide to tournament poker. Then we discuss how to go pro, which, you know, may not be your goal, but for a lot of poker players, they strive to become the best player they can be. And if they could quit their job, especially if they don't particularly like their job, or maybe they're young and they don't have a whole lot going on, going pro is a very, very reasonable option because you can pretty easily make something like $100 per hour from poker if you devote a lot of effort to getting very, very good at it. And, you know, maybe $100 is a lot of money to you, maybe it isn't. And, you know, that's, that's going to be very important to your decision, right? Anyway, we discuss all of this. Um, also things like bankroll management, the downswings that you will inevitably experience. We discussed the rake, how to minimize it, right? Because if the casino rakes away all your profits, it doesn't really happen or it doesn't, doesn't really result in you winning money, right? We discussed not loaning money out to people. Whenever you loan money out to people, sometimes they screw you and that's not good either. All right, let's take a look at a few charts from this book just to show you what we have going on. Let's take a look at this right here. All right, so here we are going to be discussing playing from the big blind, okay? And then, as you can see, we have some text explaining the scenarios and then explaining why you should play a pretty wide range. This is big blind against under the gun playing deep stacked. If we're shallower stacked or facing a minimum raise, or if there's a big ante in play, you should play even wider. But something a lot of people do wrong right off the bat is they do not three bet as a bluff with some of these you know, pretty good hands. Instead, they just only three bet the absolute best hand. So when they three bet from the big blind against the under the gun raiser, the under the gun raiser knows that you must have a very strong hand and that's going to result in them playing very, very passively against you, right? If instead you have some weaker hands in your range, it makes their decision much more difficult. Also notice hands like ace six offsuit, ace four offsuit, etc., are just folding to a three big blind raise playing deep stacked against the under the gun player because their range is going to be a lot of good, strong high cards, including all the best aces. One thing you'll also notice, every single suited hand is played. A lot of people play the A6 offsuit every time, but they don't play the 7-2 suited. And that's an error. And if you make consistent errors before the flop on a regular basis, well, <laughs> the money is not going to flow in your direction. Let's take a look at something else here. Now we are going to be discussing when there is a re-raise before the flop. So, well, let's get right to it. Let's go over here. So, in this scenario... Someone raises and we re-raise, okay? When we re-raise in this particular scenario, the actual spot does not matter. This is going to be our range. Again, we don't want to go too in-depth here because uh, the video is already getting long. In this spot, when the board comes ace, nine, three, you want to be categorizing your hands into premium made hands, draws, marginal made hands, and junk, as we discussed at the top of the show. And um, then you want to bet with your premium made hands and your draws and depending on how your range lines up with your opponent's range, which is explained thoroughly in this book, um, maybe you want to be betting with your marginal made hands and junk. In this instance, we decide we do not. Um, notice that aces is slow played as a marginal made hand to protect the rest of our range. So you see here, we have like ace king, pretty, pretty good on ace nine three. Ace nine, pretty good. Ace three, pretty good. These are our premium hands. Our draws are going to be <laughs> pretty weak draws on ace nine three with no flush draw right but you see all of these are going to be like backdoor flush draw over card to the nine right stuff like that backdoor straight draw so they kind of count in general whenever you are betting with what is essentially a polarized range your best hands and your draws as we are in this scenario at most at absolute most you can have two draws to one premium made hand here it's about whatever it is 1.3 to one so this is fine this is going to be a relatively balanced betting strategy and difficult to play against and notice our marginal made hands are either going to be top set, which is actually a slow play nuts, 
Ace-5 and Ace-2, which are pretty good. Kings, Queens, and Jacks, which are also pretty good. These are hands that can very reasonably check and call. In this scenario, we don't actually have any junk. Quite often, we have junk. Maybe we could give up with some of these hands that are in pink every once in a while, but we don't need to. We can just bluff them because our range is so strong. And going through and analyzing your range like this is going to go a long way to helping you play appropriately. Here's how the opponent should react. Again, they want to go through and categorize their range. Notice their range is different than the three betters because the three better has all the best hands, right? Plus some bluffs, right? All the best hands plus some bluffs. Whereas the caller does not have the best hands anymore because they would have four bet those, right? So you go through and you, again, categorize your range and then play accordingly, okay? And this is what you want to be doing on a very regular basis and going through this book is going to help you know how to do that. We also have uh, charts like this that essentially go through and show how to construct various ranges. In this scenario, we're on the river discussing how to structure your betting ranges based on the size of your bet. And here, as you see, when you're betting small, 10% pot, your range should be 92% value bets and 8% bluffs based on the odds your opponent is getting. Depending on your opponent's strategy, maybe you want to have fewer bluffs. But you should have some bluffs, right? What a lot of people do when they bet 10% pot is they have only value bets, in which case you're really easy to play against, right? Your opponent should just fold unless they can beat some of your value bets. We also discuss how to roughly uh, use your premium-made hands, strong marginal-made hands, weak marginal-made hands, and junk in various betting ranges. Um, as you see, as you bet bigger, you get to have more bluffs. This is something a lot of people don't fully recognize. They think that when you bet bigger, you better have a better hand because why would you put money in with garbage? Well... Turns out that you um, you get to have more bluffs as you get to bet bigger. I mean, if you love it right here, take a look at 300% pot, right? When you bet 300% pot, you get to have 43% bluffs, especially if you're very polarized, as you will be. Meaning when you bet with a value hand, a premium made hand, it's basically the nuts. So when you get called, you always win with a value hand. And when you get called and you're bluffing, you always lose. In that scenario, if that is the case, you can bet three times pot with 57% value bets and 43% bluffs, and that's going to make your opponent indifferent, which results into you winning whatever is in the pot on average, which is quite substantial. We win, win the entire pot on average. So we go through and explain how to think about your range and use the appropriate bet size. Here we are in the risk premium section. This is um, based on payout implications. We go through and explain how to figure out how much additional equity you should have when there are substantial payout implications. Usually this is gonna be when you're at the final table, right? So for example, say you're at the final table and you have a big stack. What is a big stack? I know this is kind of a, a loose definition, but let's say you have 50 big blinds. The next biggest stack also has 50 big blinds and then everybody else has 20 big blinds or fewer. In that scenario, say you raise with ace king and the other big stack just goes all in for 50 big blinds, okay? Gets back to you. You have to call 48 to try to win 100. So you need to win 48% of the time, right? But there's going to be a big risk premium at the final table because you are highly incentivized to outlast all the shorter stacks. And depending on the exact payout structure, that risk premium could be either, well, pretty big or gigantic. And this scenario is probably going to be on the higher end. So you're going to need something like, instead of 48% equity, you're going to need 48% equity plus something like 35% equity. So we're looking at, at something like 73% equity if you just ran your hand against your opponent's range to justify calling. And I hate to break it to you, but Ace King does not have, did I say 35? 75, 70, 72 percent equity, something like that. Um, Ace King is not gonna have 72 percent equity. It's just not gonna happen. So you need 35 percent equity on top of whatever your raw equity would normally be required to justify calling. So you have to put in 48 to win 100, means you need to win 48 percent plus 35. It's hard to win that often, and that's going to result in you having to fold a ton because you are highly incentivized to outlast the other players. Now you may say, why wouldn't the big stack just go all in with anything then and make you fold a ton? Because when you do actually wake up with a hand that can call, like aces and kings, and you do call, it is just an absolute disaster for that player because they took their stack that was very big and had a lot of equity and just threw it in the garbage. Notice if you're the big stack against the short stack, though, now the risk premium is basically none. So let's say you have 50 big blinds and the short stack has eight. Let's say you find a scenario where you need to win 30% of the time. Maybe you need to win like 32% of the time to adjust for the risk premium instead, which doesn't change things a ton. Uh, and then we go through and explain how medium stacked, it changes some, and then short stacked, it changes some as well. And if you're not thinking like this, when you are deep in the tournament, you're going to end up making errors because you are going to call inappropriately or fold inappropriately, and that's not going to work out well for you. You want to make sure that you are always playing well, and this book 
ensures you are playing well. So make sure you check it out. Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, the essential guide. You can get it right now at d and b poker.com slash secrets that is d a n d b dot com slash secrets hope you enjoy it we i've worked very hard on this book it's uh, been 10 years in the making it's important to realize that i've improved my skills a lot over the last 10 years I, when i first wrote the book i actually knew roughly what to do in a lot of the spots that come up very frequently but i had no clue why and there were some spots that i was just kind of clueless about a good example, I used to fold my big blind too often when shallow stacked. I would defend like 60% of hands, but you're supposed to be defending more like 80% of hands in a lot of scenarios. And that's a leak. That's a mistake. But I have improved my skills and I have learned. Also, when shallow stacked, I used to never lead all in whenever I was in the big blind and someone raised. But for example, say you're playing 12 big blinds deep and the cutoff raises and you call the big blind with a wide range. If it comes all low connected cards, like let's say 764, you should be leading all in for 2x pot some portion of the time. And I never did that back in the day because, well, I had not studied with GTO solvers and I didn't know. Nobody else was doing it either. Nobody knew. But now we have all worked hard. We've improved our skills. We have studied. And I've taken all of that work that me and my team have done and consolidated it here for a book for you so that you can get great at tournament poker quickly. So check it out at dnbpoker.com slash secrets. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks for watching. And good luck in your games. What's big, green, and gives you the freedom to do whatever you want? Yeah, it's money. And if you want to start your journey to a big pile of money, click the subscribe button right over here. See you in the next video.